you very much for the introduction. Um, yes, today I'd like to share with you some of our experiences in optimizing test utilization practices at Vanderbilt in hematopathology. And so we've kind of dubbed this uh, humorously as the right test for the right patient at the right time. Uh, the technical name for this be, uh, ended up being the Diagnostic Management Team, so you'll hear me refer to the DMT repeatedly. Um, and so what I wanted, this is an outline of the talk, and we're going to start with sort of um, you know, going over briefly some of the diagnostic challenges in personalized medicine. I think this is something that everybody in the room is going to be very painfully aware of, so I think um, this will be more of a, a bonding sort of experience for all of us. Um, and then from there, I'll move on to sort of the DMT definition, our, our design and implementation of it. Lastly, a, a bit on impact and outcomes, and then sort of a rough overview of some of the other applications um, within Vanderbilt, because it's part of a sort of a greater effort to do these diagno diagnostic management teams across multiple different disciplines. So one of the first problems that I think that we're all very painfully aware of is the fact that um, the clinical care, our clinical care colleagues and the laboratorians are very, very separate. We're physically separate in most institutions. Um, and in fact, there's sort of a mindset difference. And in many cases, I think they really do view us all as lab rats. And there's a tendency for them to order tests and throw those orders over a wall. And then we do the tests, and then we get results, and we throw them back over the wall at them. And um, I think this is really highlighted by the fact that we do not even speak the same language. So really what uh, you know, a, a clinical care um, uh, practitioner really needs to know is what does a test result mean for this particular patient. And so that's really predict positive predictive value, negative predictive value. Um, but we are, it's ingrained in us from day one of residency to be worried about sensitivity and specificity. How good is this test? And so um, we do not even think in the same language. Now, there are mathematical ways to convert the two for very simple types of tests such as Bayes analysis, but honestly, you're your hemonc nurse practitioner is not sitting there doing Bayes analysis in their head before they go in to see the patient. And so this is not something that, you know, that is, um, because of the language difference, I think it creates a lot of, uh, amplifies the silo problem. Um, another issue is that you, we would like to be able to make testing decisions with the absolute most or maximal pretesting information. Um, but this is a very, very typical scenario, which is that you know a hematologist has a patient with anemia. They've ruled out iron deficiency and other nutritional deficiencies. They've ruled out sort of medication effects. But within the hematopathology realm, the differential for anemia is still vast, right? And if you have a vast differential, that means there's a vast number of tests that you can use to, to interrogate all of those um, different entities. And so there's pretty much a direct correlation between the breadth of your differential and the number of tests that you need to do in order to you know, exclude all the diagnostic possibilities and winnow it down to the diagnosis. And so what we'd like to do is to be able to make some of the massive testing decision, push that decision-making process as far possible over to, to, the, to the right side of the x-axis. Um, in order to sort of minimize the number of ancillary tests that you have to do. So you want to go in with the most possible information. The corollary to this is simply the sheer number of tests and results that are available out there. This is a slide I stole from um, one of my colleagues, Mike Laposada, where you know, clinical laboratory testing in the 1970s really comprised of like 30 to 50 tests, and they were all pretty much chemistry tests. Um, and then this is from 2010, and he describes you know, over 5,000 different lab tests. Well, now in 2014, there's next-gen sequencing, so you can multiply that by the genome pretty much. And so you know, you, there's this vast number of tests that are available and that people want to have for their patients, and yet we, you know, how is it possible to really understand what all of that means? Um, and this is really highlighted by a study that was done by Brian Smith at Yale, where he looked into the number of hours in med medical school that our clinician, uh, practicing clinician colleagues are, have in interpreting these and in, uh, understanding laboratory data. And so if you look, 100% of medical schools have some session where the, the medical students have to sit down and look through a microscope and see what a GI tract looks like. Um, the number of hours may vary a little bit, but if you think about it, how many, how many hours in clinical practice does an inter internal medicine doctor actually spend thinking about anatomic pathology? It's essentially zero. Yes, they have to remember the head bones connected to the neck bone and things like that, but that's about the level we're talking about here. They don't need to know the level of anatomic pathology that all of our um, surge path colleagues do. By contrast, there is not even 10% of medical schools have any sort of rigorous training in lab medicine. And this is a huge deficit in their training. Um, 
and that the number of hours that are spent doing that training are, is very, very minimal, and yet they order tests daily, and they're asked, you know, they need to interpret those tests daily, hundreds and hundreds of these every day. And so there's a there's that huge disconnect. Um, and so now the hematologist has a handful of results which have arrived over you know, a span of time. For instance, our morphology and flow results may come out within 24 hours and be uploaded in the computer, but molecular results may take a few days later depending on what type of test it is. Depending on how busy your cytogenetics and fish labs are, it could be anywhere from 42, 48 to 72 hours or it can be two weeks coming back. Um, and then some molecular results need to be batched and may take weeks to come back, right? Um, and so you, they're ending up with a whole bunch of different test results, the vast majority of which do not actually add to their understanding of what's going on with this patient. They're negative, negative results. Now that's not to say that negative results are, do not help guide them, but they are, themselves are, do not lead them towards the diagnosis. Or, um, they're just simply exclusionary. And they've come out over a span of time. And then there's the whole added complexity of non-categorical results. And I think all of us are painfully aware of sitting there and looking at your T-gamma gene rearrangement studies and going, well, is that a real clone or not? It's kind of jaggedy. And is so, you know, we have a lot of, you know, sort of couched terms of small clone of unclear clinical significance or atypical pattern by fish, et cetera. And so how can a clinician really dig, all, dig through all of this and come to an understanding of what's going on with the patient? What they really want is the whole puzzle put together for them and say, hey, this patient has an NPM positive normal karyotype AML. That's really what our clinician colleagues want, and that's what we want to be giving them, is that type of a comprehensive report. Once that happens, though, then there's the whole added problem of keeping track of the results, because we don't just see these patients once in heme path. It's very different than in surgical pathology, where you may just see a, the resection one time, and then that's, that's it. You see these patients over and over and over again in, this, in hematopathology. And so the patients come back, and the doctor's caught. They're running from around from patient to patient, and the nurse practitioner is saying, hey, the guy's back for Mr. Smith's back for his follow-up biopsy. What do you want to order? And the clinician says, well, you know, I am in the middle of 10 other things right now. I'm running from one patient's room to another patient's room. Just order everything. He can't remember how many tests he ordered the first time and how many tests, the, which ones of those were positive. And so he just says, just order everything. And this is actually verbatim from one of my clinical colleagues. This is his general response to when the nurses um, start asking him about test orders. And so um, really, I think we are all painfully aware of those diagnostic challenges. Um, and so what happened is we sort of came up with this idea of this diagnostic management team um, as a way to sort of um, come to some sort of an agreement with our clinicians as what is appropriate testing, when that testing should be ordered with how much pre-testing information, um, and how we were going to put it all together um, for them. And so uh, the impetus didn't, was not one-sided. It really was two-sided. Our hematologists you know, and again, these are verbatim quotes actually cut out of emails that were sent to me. You know, we need a plan in place to make certain that we're ordering the right tests. You know, it would be great if we knew how much these tests cost. Can some of the marrow be set aside so if we forgot a test, we can add it on later? These are all questions that they had f um, to, for us, the pathologists, um, which show that they, they really are sort of struggling with trying to deal with the massive number of tests that are available and, and keeping track of everything. And well, the other thing I will say is that you will notice that none of them actually address clinical sensitivity and analytical sensitivity of various tests because that doesn't even cross their minds, okay? They don't even realize that the test that they, they, they're ordering may not be appropriate. That, that doesn't even cross their minds. Um, whereas from our standpoint, we're like, oh my gosh, why are they ordering this test? You know, the patient was negative at diagnosis. Why are we using it to monitor this patient? Or um, why are they ordering this molecular test? It's not sensitive enough to be used for MRD. Or, you know, they're ordering the fish and the PCR. We know the PCR uh, detects this person's clone, so why are they doing both? The PCR is much more sensitive. And so, you know, we had our own frustrations. And so we all came together and came up with a diagnostic management team. Um, there are sort of three legs that this stands upon, and two of which are really kind of a sine qua non for this process. The first is that we developed evidence-based testing guidelines and algorithms developed by physicians for physicians. The second leg, which is the one that is sort of icing on the cake, really, is the informatics solutions that really allow us to do this process in a much more facile manner. And then the final is a rapid learning system that allows us to continuously improve each iteration of our SOPs. 
Um, and so we'll talk about first about the evidence-based guidelines. The, really, this addressed a lot of the issues. We, what we did is we broke down those silos and got us all on the same page together. Um, and so the, we had teams of us. So there were paired, pairs of pathologists and hematologists who came together to decide on appropriate tests for different diseases. And so, for instance, um, I worked with my hematology colleagues on AML, MDS, and bone marrow failure because I'm kind of a myeloid person. Um, and other people worked on myeloma. Other per people worked on lymphoma or MPNs, and et cetera. And I think what this did, so the, these little smaller groups came together. We discussed what we thought were appropriate testing practices for those diseases. And then we went back to our co colleagues. So I went back to the pathologist, and my hematologist colleague went back to all of his hematology colleagues. And we fully vetted those SOPs amongst all members of both groups. And then the final version came together in the SOP. And by doing this, it really avoids the laboratory and having to police their colleagues. Um, this is something that we all do all the time. Um, that's pretty much what lab medicine rounds are. You know, I went, I sat in through your residency rounds today, and I remember from my own residency training, that's what we did. We policed our clinician colleagues and told them, no, 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 you don't want this test. But, you know, ultimately, I think that that sort of undermines our collegiality, and that's something that we would like to not to do as little as possible. We want it to be a joint effort together. Um, the, other, the, the thing about these SOPs is that they were not specific just to the disease, but also to the stage of therapy. And this is very important. Many places have sort of diagnostic algorithms, but those are just for diagnosis. And so what we have is going across all different stages of disease. Um, and we are doing this after we've already viewed the aspirate and biopsy. And so this required some workflow changes to actually hold samples aside. Um, to get all the, all the requisite tubes up front, but then hold them until we've had a chance to have the most pre-testing um, knowledge of what's going on in this patient. Um, and then finally, we wanted our SOPs to be evidence-based as much as possible. So we looked to the published literature, clinical guidelines, um, but ultimately, most of what we put into our initial guidelines were agreed upon best practices, expert opinion, where the expert opinion was, oh, my opinion, basically, <laughs> and my clinician colleague's opinion. Um, and so, um, and so w because there was this lack of evidence-based knowledge, what we did is we, we all decided upon SOPs and we erred on the side of doing extra testing. If there was any debate amongst us as to whether or not we should do a test, we would say, okay, we'll just do it. And we'll gather the data for a year and see whether or not that data is really informative, or that test is really informative. And so it became an iterative process. So again, just this is the typical pyramid of levels of clinical evidence with um, filtered information having systemic reviews and evidence you know, guidelines up at the top. But really, as you all know, the, the pinnacle of the unfiltered information really is randomized controlled trials. There just are not randomized controlled trials out there for whether or not you should do this particular test at this particular stage of a patient's disease. It just doesn't exist. And so really what we're left with is sort of retrospective analyses and expert opinion. And so that's what we were left with. And so that's how we designed our SOPs. So this is sort of a grid of how those SOPs appeared with um, different diseases here on the y-axis and different stages of disease on the x-axis. And all of these stages here, with the exception of staging marrows and lymphoma, are really sort of overt disease, and everything on the far right is, is no overt disease. You know? And so the t testing, I, when you're looking for MRD, it's different than when you're talking about stuff at diagnosis. So the general philosophy was that at diagnosis, we needed to do those tests that would help us make the diagnosis. And in hematolymphoid neoplasms in this day and age, the criteria for making those diagnoses in many cases is based on molecular cytogenetic information. And so we need to get that up front. Um, we need to do those tests that are important in guiding treatment. This is one of the um, sort of the dirty laundry of hematolymphoid malignancies, which is that there really aren't that many treatments for most of these. There's 7 plus 3 for AML. There's RCHOP and hyper CVAD for lymphoma. And there aren't that many options. Um, but certainly, you know, we need to know whether it's a 15, 17, you know, for ATRA treatment, et cetera. But in terms, so that leads to the question of exactly how much utility prognostic markers are, because most of the markers that we know about in like AML and um, actually most of the diseases are simply prognostic markers. And the question is, well, what utility is that really when you have one chemotherapy that you do for all of your AML patients? But I think the question in hematolymphoid neoplasms is more that um, many of these patients get transplanted in CR1, but in patients that have good risk disease, they may not. And so the, it's really a question of whether or not to transplant in CR1 versus their actual induction chemotherapy. And so we do include prognostic markers to help guide and educate that first decision. And then 
we, if, the, if a test is going to be useful for monitoring minimal residual disease, we do it up front because not all tests have 100% clinical sensitivity. You can do the test and the neoplasm is there and the test will not detect it, right? Um, this is true for some immunoglobulin gene rearrangements. Most of the molecular tests for BCL2 rearrangements, for instance, that you want to do by PCR, you know, will most places do just the major breakpoint region and the minor cluster region, and they, that will only pick up, you know, 55 to 85 percent of cases. So you'll miss some of them because of lack of clinical sensitivity. So you want to know that your test actually detects the patient's disease, even though you don't need it to make a diagnosis. You're going to need that result later on to compare to. Um, at relapse, we do those um, tests that are important for treatment slash prognosis moving forward from the time of relapse, and then again, useful for MRD moving forward. And then finally, in the cases where there's no overt disease, we're pretty much looking at the most analytically sensitive minimal residual disease marker. And so just as an example, um, uh, at, for AML at diagnosis, obviously there's the morphology, there's the flow cytometry to immunophenotype the blast, there's karyotype. Um, there's AML fish panel because we recognize that certain translocations, rearrangements of MLL, for instance, or inversion 16, are sometimes very cryptic by karyotype. And so we need to know that information um, in, uh, by fish. Um, you'll notice I don't have the MDS fish panel here, and I'll get to that uh, um, at, towards the end of the talk as to why we don't have the MDS fish panel listed here. Um, on the molecular front, we do FLT3 ITD testing and NPM testing on all patients. And so um, you may be asking, why are you doing NPM on all patients when you know that NPM is prognostically important in normal karyotype AMLs? But about 8% of NPM positive patients have an abnormal karyotype. And in those patients, it may not be prognostically useful, but it can be used as an MRD marker later on. And so that's why we do it on all patients. Um, within our AML snapshot panel, we also have a C-kit, DNMT3A, IDH, and FLT3 TKD mutations as well. And then um, we most recently have uh, been discussing how to bring on next-gen sequencing, and it would be remiss of me not to mention that at all. Um, the current idea is that we would use it rather sparingly for the normal karyotype snapshot negative fish negative patients. Um, in cases where um, a positive mutation, for instance, in P53, might, uh, might educate that do we transplant or not in CR1 decision. Um, and so then, um, for instance, at relapse, we don't necessarily do all the same testing. We'll do flow cytometry, we'll do karyotype, obviously. Um, we'll do NPM and CKIT only if it was previously positive as, um, to continue to monitor their disease status. Um, but FLT3 ITD, we will do regardless. And this is, again, because of their realization that in about 12% of cases, FLT3 will change status. Most of the time it goes from positive to, or sorry, from negative to positive, but there are some cases where it goes from positive to negative as well. Um, and so we retest FLT3 at uh, relapse because we ca it can change status. You'll notice I don't have CEBPA on this list, and that's for a couple of very, um, uh, a couple of reasons. The first is that CEBPA um, is done by sequencing, and so uh, it's not going to be useful as an MRD marker moving forward. The second reason is that CEBPA in normal karyotype AMLs is useful for, uh, is predicts a good progno prognosis in these patients. But if the patient has relapsed, by definition, they're no longer good prognosis. So we don't really care about any good prognostic CEBPA marker. Um, and so that's why it's not on there. Um, I have down there to consider NGS panel for treatment failure. This is what our clinicians would love to have, to have something that tells them some off-label use of some other um, targeted therapy that might be useful in this patient. But realistically, because of sort of the urgency of a relapsed AML, these patients are often, unfortunately, they pass away before the next-gen sequencing results even come back. Um, and so it, it's a little bit of a limitation there. So in order for us to make these decisions, we have to actually know at which stage the patient is, right? We have to um, know in which grid to place them. And part of that is getting good history. And so, you know, we want to know, do, does the patient have a known diagnosis? If so, what is it? Is this a follow-up therapy, a new sample? Is this the first time they're coming to Vanderbilt? Um, if they, have they had prior testing, what were the results of that testing? And so we've developed a hematopathology testing form that is a clickable form that's um, tied to our EMR. So the, the nurse practitioner or the fellow who's ordering the bone marrow study can open it up, click on the, the diagnosis, and then a bunch of different molecular and genetic changes will pop up, and they can click on the appropriate one. Um, 
They can tell us at what stage the patient is, what treatment they've had, are they post-transplant or not, um, what they're worried about. Um, and then also whether or not the patient's a clinical trial patient, because that may affect reimbursement, that may affect the tests that we need to do as well. Um, and so that's part of making decisions with the most pretest information, but really that's just, honestly, that's just good practice, right? Everyone who gets a bone marrow should get some clinical history from their colleagues, right? Um, but what we do is we hold all of those decisions until we've also looked at the morphology of the aspirin and the bone marrow, any immunohistochemical stains, any flow cytometry, and we use all of that information together to help guide which molecular tests, fish, or carrier uh, metaphase cytogenetic studies we need to do. And the reason for this is that the clinician may think that their lymphoma patient has relapsed because they're cytopenic, but in fact, maybe it's a secondary MDS, and there are different considerations, therefore. Now we're thinking MRD for their lymphoma, and we're thinking now what we need to do about MDS. And so we need to know what's in the marrow, which the there's no possible way a clinician can know that, right? We can see what's inside the marrow, and that helps us guide therapy or guide testing practices. And then we take the information from all of those different ancillary tests and funnel that into a single diagnosis in a comprehensive report. So our comprehensive reports have a comprehensive diagnosis that accounts for all of the testing results. It uses standardized language, and this is language that we all, again, worked on as teams to come up with, where that language is guided by the most recent publications defining CR and PR, um, guided by the requirements of cl clinical trial reporting, and I'll show you an example of, of that. And then we have an interpretation as well, um, and then this also can use some partially canned comments that we've you know, developed to help suggest or to to interpret what this combination of mutations might mean. Um, and then everything from there on down are the ancillary tests, the original morphologic report and all of the ancillary data, which originally came out in separate reports at different times, all located in a single report together. Um, I've mentioned some of the IT tools already, but um, this really gets to sort of the second leg of the DMT, which is really um, having the informatics solutions to allow all of this to happen in the most facile manner. Um, and so I can't thank our IT colleagues enough. We literally, there were three of us who sort of came up with this idea initially. We were, it was a sunny day, spring of 2010. We were in the courtyard at Vanderbilt and we started scribbling on napkins. And you know, almost literally we gave those napkins to our IT colleagues and they brought it all to life, which was just amazing. Um, so this is one of the things that we scribbled on a napkin, which is the hematopathology flow sheet. In a single screenshot in our EMR, we can see the entire longitudinal history of a patient's disease. So for instance, here, you can see in this first column, this patient was diagnosed with AML. And we have their karyotype here. They had a deletion 9. They're FLT3 positive and NPM positive. Um, and they actually also had a low-level MLL um, rearrangement. Um, and so th they had an abnormal karyotype, uh, FLT3 and NPM positivity. At day 14, they still had residual disease by cytogenetics and molecular studies, and we can see all of that here. It, um, and then eventually they went into complete remission. And this is important because this is exactly how our clinician colleagues said they wanted us to report this out. So it says, complete remission marrow, no morphologic immunophenotypic cytogenetic or molecular evidence. We name all the different modalities um, of leukemia. And then we list the ANC and the platelet count. And the reason for this is that there's a difference in the clinical trials between a complete response with complete count recovery and complete response with incomplete count recovery. And so this way we can show them this is a full CR, not a CRI. Um, and then event, I left out a couple of time points just so it fit nicely on a screen, but then um, you, um, then the patient got transplanted and shortly thereafter relapsed, and you can see that they are only partially engrafted, and they, the NPM and the FLT3 have popped back up now. Um, all of the blue things are hyperlinks, and so you can actually click on the blue link, and it will pop up the initial morphologic report or the initial cytogenetic report. So you have direct access to all of the um, original reports as well through this flow sheet. Um, I mentioned earlier the bone marrow testing form that allows us to get a better clinical history. Mostly, you know, from the flow sheet, we get a pretty good idea of what's going on with the patient. But what this really tells us is why is the bone marrow being done now? What are you worried about? And so that's sort of the added piece of information that the bone marrow testing form provides. When we actually do our reports, we do our reports in a report generating um, program called Quill. Um, and what this does is it actually creates um, discrete data elements that can be housed in a data warehouse 
um, and that can be extracted later on for research purposes, et cetera. And so um, we have, you know, the diagnostic and, uh, diagnosis and impression up top, but then we have the peripheral blood smear, aspirate and touch prep, uh, bone marrow biopsy and particle prep um, descriptions. And then when you pop open each one of those sec sections, you can see that in the aspirate smear, it asks about cellularity, and then it goes through megakaryocytes, myeloid elements, erythroid elements, and it blasts plasma cells, lymphocytes. And in each case, the resident has, when they preview it, clicks both quantity and quality for all three lineages and then says something about blast plasma cells and lymphocytes. And so what this has been, pedagogically, this has actually been fantastic because this basically ingrains in all of our residents that what those three lineages are and that you have to mention them every single time and tell us how many there were and what they looked like. And, um, and for any abnormal cell, we just click, we can type in the per percentage here from our differential and um, describe, we have a bunch of canned dis, um, uh, descriptions for those cells. And what we can do is we can pull out every case that had erythroid hyperplasia in MDS. We can pull out every case of ring sideroblasts um, from this warehouse. The whole, um, the differential count is also included in here. And then also here, the cytogenetic and molecular diagnostic results. Um, the flow report goes directly into this morphologic report. But those other reports that are going to be ancillary tests that are ha going to have separate reports that come out later, we at least mention here, we click on every single test that we're ordering so our clinicians know what we've ordered. Um, and then what this does is it creates a structured prose report. And the reason why, I mean, this is an ideal system to develop a synoptic report, but when we polled our clinician colleagues and our clinicians co polled their patients, the patients uniformly across the board said they wanted a prose report not a synoptic report. So we had Quill turn it into a prose report. There are some glitches and there's you know, what we refer to as Quill speak. Sometimes it's very stilted and slightly odd. Um, but for the most part, we get a nice readable structured um, prose report from all of this. And so as we mentioned, you know, there are communication challenges that we had to overcome in that we wanted the most pretest information possible from the clinicians. But if the clinicians in relinquishing their test ordering um, dis decision making process, you know, there's this, that little antsy bit of, well, then what are the pathologists ordering, right, on my patient? And so they need to have that reassurance that they know exactly what's going on with all of the testing. And so what we did is we created dashboards um, for both the pathologists and the clinicians where, for instance, if I'm on service, the dash I can make a patient panel for all of my patients that I'm seeing that day. Um, and then I can see exactly what the status is of all the testing. And so there are um, color indicators where um, a V stands for something that's pending. So here the comprehensive report hasn't been written on this patient yet. In, in green are all the tests where all the tests in that category have been completed. So there is a hem, uh, hematopathology testing form. There is a morphologic report. The cytogenetics has been reported. The fish has been reported. And the molecular is all completed as well. Um, and yellow means some things have been resulted and some things are pending. For instance, the bone and Grafman study may be completed, but the T gamma is still pending. And so if you actually hover on the, icon, on the color indicator, it'll tell you exactly what test is pending. And so this is a great way for us to be communicating with our clinician colleagues as to what the status is of all the testing. Um, as a, on the flip side, we can actually use this as well for the clinical lab. Our lab managers can use this to track turnaround times for the testing as well. Um, and what happens then is then we use these to auto-populate a comprehensive report. I showed you what the comprehensive report looks like before. What I didn't tell you before is that all of these report fields are automatically populated once we open the, the report. So basically, once we see everything go green, basically, across the line of those color indicators, we go into Quill, open up the report, and everything from clinical history on down is already there. And then we just add in our canned comprehensive diagnosis and our... Um, interpretation. And again, we have sort of already canned comments for all of those things as well to help guide your interpretation. Um, the last critical leg of the DMT is that it has to be a rapid learning process. I'm going to come back to this point after we talk about some of the impact and outcomes because this directly builds upon those outcomes as well. And so uh, in talking about impact and outcomes, we asked ourselves, well, what would a successful DMT look like? And so um, one thing that has to be done is that the pathologists have to feel empowered to actually do that testing themselves. Um, in other words, the clinicians have to be confident in the system, um, that confident that their pathologists are ordering the right tests, and we actually have to get approval all the way from the, the institutional medical board as well to allow this reflex testing to occur. 
the system would have to be efficient in um, leading to time savings in some way, shape, or form. It needed to be effective that we improve test utilization. And then finally, we needed to have room for this to evolve, okay, as evidence for best practices accumulates over time. And so in terms of our empowerment, um, what we did is about 11 months after go live of the DMT, which um, I was the lucky guinea pig who was on service, and I have fondly referred to it as V-Day because it was Valentine's Day 2011 when we went live. Um, and about 11 months after that, we polled our clinician care colleagues. And so those were um, both nurse practitioners and the hemonc docs. And what we found is that sort of across the board, if you look at the top four bars here, is that there's overwhelming um, approval that they are aware of the option to, to order the bone marrow testing panel. They agree that um, they've read the SOPs for, <laughs> for the bone marrow testing ordering, ordering um, and that they trust the pathologist to order the right tests and that they trust the SOPs to help the pathologist order the right tests. So we had pretty much overwhelming um, acceptance by the clinicians that this really is a good way to go. And the true test of that, of course, is when we offered to give them back all of their test ordering um, uh, um, responsibilities, they said, no, thank you. Um, so they really didn't want it back. And actually, the nurse practitioners in particular want nothing to do with test ordering, if at all possible. Um, and so this is, uh, this is the acceptance of the DMT over the course of time during that first year. And so you can see there's a little bit of a lag, but you can see that by the end of a year, really within the first couple of months, um, almost everyone was using the bone marrow testing panel. Now, we don't necessarily expect this to go entirely to, um, to one here or 100%, um, and we definitely don't expect the a la carte test ordering to go to zero. And this is because we always reserve the right for any clinician or any pathologist to order whatever test they think is relevant for this patient on top of the bone marrow testing panel. So in many of these cases down here um, in red are actually they ordered the bone marrow testing panel panel, and then they said to their nurse practitioner, please mark that no matter what, they still need to do this test, you know, because they really think that that's important for the patient for whatever reason. And so we always do that. Um, by the same token, we reserve the right to say, well, you know, this patient has AML, but look, there's this paratrabecular lymphoid aggregate, and look, those cells look really raisinoid. I want to order some follicular lymphoma testing. And so that's always, you know, we can always have that option as well. So we can go off SOP at any time as clinically indicated. Um, so the, uh, the DMT also needs to be efficient. So it needs to save time in some way, shape, or form. And the two areas in which it seemed to save the most time for the clinicians was it saved time in ordering the bone marrow testing panel instead of ordering a la carte individual tests. And it saved time in terms of reviewing the patient's status. Like prior going into the patient's room, they just pull up the comprehensive report and they have all the data. Rather than pulling up five different reports and hunting around for which day those reports were put in the EMR, they can just instead pull up the one report, read it over, walk into the patient's room. And so some total, this is saving them about 10 minutes per patient. And so if you imagine how many pa patients are getting bone marrows every day, we're talking about time that can be used now in this RVU-driven you know, world that we live in, they can see extra patients during this time. So we've actually increased their ability to um, see additional patients. Now, the, 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 time, the time that they save is time lost to the pathologist, quite frankly. There is more time on our part, for sure. Um, where we save time is the automated um, report generator really does save a lot of time for us. We can sit there at the scope, look at what buttons the resident has clicked, maybe argue with them over a couple and, and switch around some of the buttons and, you know, finesse their diagnostic line interpretation. And then it goes to the admin and it shows up in our queue ready to sign out, you know, 20 minutes later. So um, usually within less than 24 hours, even with IHCs, we can get um, a bone marrow signed out. What takes time is actually in reviewing the patient histories, determining the testing, uh, making those test determinations, and then writing the comprehensive reports. But honestly, those are things that we need to be doing anyway, right? Reviewing the patient history, that is something we need to be doing all the time for every bone marrow we look at anyway. And so, and much of that is actually done by the resident or with the resident. And so um, it's an important part of any practicing pathologist. And in terms of the time that it takes in the comprehensive reports, that auto population really saved a whole lot of time in generating those comprehensive reports. Prior to this four year, we were doing addenda and we were manually transcribing in all of the ancillary reports. Um, and so having this report generation with auto population vastly improved that process. Um, it is more time, 
but it's, it's time that we would have to spend anyway because everyone is going towards those comprehensive reports. We needed to go there too, and so um, it's time well spent, I, th I feel, in producing pa uh, better patient care. Um, so how effective were we? Uh, before the DMT, uh, we kind of did a retrospective six-month analysis of all of the testing practices for every bone marrow prior to going live with the, prior to V-Day, basically. Um, and we looked at, based on the SOPs, version one of the SOPs, how many of those tests were extraneous tests. And so we looked, and the total tests per marrow were about 3.7. And by test, I mean a single karyotype or an NPM1 test or uh, a 1517 uh, fish probes, set of fish probes. So that's, that's what I mean by a test. So a panel, a myeloma panel is multiple tests. Um, and what we found is that about 1.3 of those tests were discordant or extra testing that was not necessary compared to uh, the version one of the SOPs. That left 2.4 that were concordant, but there were actually a low level of cell, um, tests that were actually omitted. Often MRD follow-up tests were, you know, weren't ordered by the clinicians, and so those were admitted tests. And so the, the ideal would have been about 2.8 with a savings of about one test um, per marrow for 26% savings. And so, um, so how good were we once we went live? So let's first look at this discordant number here. Um, after going live with it, in the 12 months go after going live with the DMT, we decreased unnecessary testing by 69%. It was not 100%, and we didn't expect it to go to 100% because of the reasons I told you, that we always reserve the right to go off as the SOPs and do stuff a la carte. Um, but we decreased that by uh, 69%. How about the omitted tests here? Um, so we uh, decreased omitted tests by 88%. That is one that we would love to have go to zero. But in fact, the SOP is this grid, right? And we all know that there's sort of a continuum of disease and that many, many patients don't fit exactly into one of those grid spots. And so that's why there's some discrepancy there. Um, this slide, I think, is really, really important. And as lab medicine folks, I think you guys will all appreciate this. When trying to figure out um, whether we're doing any good by this, um, we looked at the rate of positivity of tests, and we were able to increase that by 75%. So why is that relevant? The, it's relevant because if you think about your typical Bayes analysis or, uh, Bayes analysis or any test, you can think that if you increase your pretest probability, you increase your positive predictive value on the back end after the test is performed, right? That's just sort of basic lab medicine, and that's what we're doing. We're winnowing down the number of patients in which we do the test so that we're making the test, doing the test in the most appropriate settings, and therefore we've increased the positive predictive value for all of those tests that we do do, minimizing the number of false positives. Um, now, there could be a potential negative impact to reducing testing, right? Maybe we're eliminating some actionable data by, do, by cutting out these tests. And so the way that we did this is we looked at those um, discordant tests that were performed, um, which is this number here. This is a combined prospective retrospe retros retrospective analysis. And you can see that about 4% of those were positive. Um, and so of those 79 cases, you know, how many of those actually gave us information that we wouldn't have gotten in another way that really affected how we would treat that patient? And so when you drill down to it, over half of those cases are redundant testing, i.e. they did BCR by, BCR able by fish and by PCR. No reason to do that. Or um, in Grafman studies by XY fish and by STR analysis. There's no reason to do that. Um, about half of a percent of cases were low level unique changes that went away by the next time. So those are actually probably false positives even. We know that there are a lot of transient karyotypic changes that can occur. Um, as a result of chemotherapy, and these are heavily treated patients for the most part. Um, and so those are probably transient changes that we don't necessarily want to act upon. Um, and then the, about a half a percent were some MDS-related changes, and about another half a percent were some level of minimal residual disease. And so you could argue that those actually were actionable information that we were, we were missing. But one, it's only about 1% of all cases. And secondly, for a lot of low-level MDS karyotype changes and a lot of MRD testing, especially by molecular, uh, our clinicians don't, at Vanderbilt don't actually do anything different. 
they just kind of, they wait and watch with the MDS phenotype. If the patient is stable, they will wait and watch and wait for it to fully declare itself before they do anything. And in the MRD state, in the, with the exception of precursor B lymphoblastic leukemia, where there is definite data that show if you're flow MRD positive, you treat early, you, the patient does better. That's definitely been shown, but in a lot of other diseases, MRD positivity doesn't really um, necessarily change how they stage. We, our clinicians don't even upstage if, for lymphoma patients if they're, um, if they're molecularly positive in the marrow. They're morphologically immunophenotypically negative, but a molecular comes back positive for IGH gene rearrangement. They don't actually upstage them at all, and so it doesn't really affect their therapy. It's something that they might wait and watch on, which is what they would do anyway on these patients. So we don't really feel that we're losing a lot of important information by eliminating these tests. Most importantly, the DMT actually decreased cost. So we were able to, to decrease total testing by 15%, not the target 26% in that fir first iteration. But like I said, we left in a lot of extra testing. Um, and the SOPs, sometimes people were not um, interpreting them. We weren't necessarily all interpreting them the same. And so by the next iteration, we had actually decreased to 21%. So this is moving along. Um, the average cost to payers of those savings was over $400 per marrow, which annualized to the Vanderbilt marrow load was anywhere from half a million to a million dollars. And when you extrapolate then to the, all the bone marrows being done in the United States, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that could be saved in unnecessary bone marrow testing, uh, ancillary testing. So this brings me back to the rapid learning system um, that we used. We used our data um, that we generated because we put all of this information into a data warehouse database and then we could kind of look globally at whether what tests were actually useful and where tests were not useful. And so this is an example of a heat map that was pr produced looking at the data. Um, and you can see very clearly that when you were in the red, the, those tests were almost never positive. They never gave sort of additional actionable data. This is not completely to say that negative data is not actionable because that's important too, but this, um, I think this really sort of is a pictorial way to sort of get a gauge. Um, and so what we did is we, we started asking a lot of clinically relevant questions to fill in the gaps where of evidence. So we would ask, how often is MDS fish positive at diagnosis if the karyotype is normal? If you've got a good quality 20 metaphase karyotype, how often does fish give you any added information above that karyotype? And what we found, uh, this was looking at 149 marrows, and what we found is that in karyotype negative cases, only 2% of those had positive fish results. And so of those three cases, two were negative on follow-up marrow and one patient was lost to follow-up. And so, you know, the utility is really very low at diagnosis. And then we asked the question, well, how often is MDS fish positive at follow-up when you have a good quality karyotype? And here we had 10 patients that had um, positive fish results. Um, but of those 10 cases, two were likely false positives. In other words, they were transient findings that went away on all the subsequent marrows. Uh, three were negative on follow-up, so the disease was going away. Um, and in only five cases, or 2% of cases, were the markers actually really of early relapse or persistent disease. And for those cases with persistent disease, we knew they had persistent disease already. Um, and only in two of those cases were the, the MDS changes not known to be previously positive, so they were kind of new findings. And so it's a very low number of cases where where FISH is providing added information above and beyond the karyotype for MDS. And actually not just for MDS, these are across all different diagnoses. So this includes AML, MRC as well. And so that's why we've eliminated MDS FISH from many of our um, protocols. Um, sorry, MDS FISH. Um, so we also asked the question, how often is plasma cell myeloma FISH positive when there's no morphologic or immunophenotypic evidence of disease? Um, and shown in orange here were all the cases that were morphologically uh, or immuno and or immunophenotypically positive for plasma cell myeloma. And you can see that the, of those, 17% uh, had an abnormal FISH result. So that's a pretty reasonable percentage. Um, when you look here at the morphologically negative cases, less than 5%, the dark blue, um, had an abnormal karyotype. And by contrast, you know, these, these are not insignificant because these are, you know, these are DEL17P, DEL13Q. These are things that are actually very um, prognostically important for these patients. But uh, if you look at their protein studies, 71% of these same set of patients, morphologically negative patients, were positive for at least one protein study. So 
you know, our clinicians were trying to use fish as an MRD marker, and we all know that it's not clinically sen or analytically sensitive enough to use as MRD, and in fact, the, the um, protein studies are much a better measure of that. And so we've eliminated a lot of fish that way, too. Um, so we've been asking a lot of questions and, and generating a lot of issues. We've been looking at MRD studies and things like that using our own data. And what this allows us to do is we've taken the initial SOP, we've used it for a year, we did the data analysis, and we revised the SOPs. So we're now undergoing revision number three in preparation of making version four of our SOPs at this point in time. And so every year we've been iterating these and tweaking our SOPs. Now we tweak them based on what's going on, how we, well, how we do these tests at Vanderbilt. So for instance, this, this study here would be very different if you sorted, selected for CD138 positive plasma cells up front, which we do not do at Vanderbilt. So this would be a very different study at an institution that actually does that. Um, and so again, where we were left with sort of retrospective analysis and expert opinion, we've now we are now replacing that with actual data, which is glorious. Um, this is just a cartoon I drew of sort of the, the pressures that we're feeling in lab medicine where reimbursements are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the number of things that we want to test is expanding dramatically, especially with next-gen sequencing. The number of genes, the number of tests we want to do is really huge. And I've randomly drawn an arrow saying we are here. I actually don't know where we are, but I think we're feeling the discrepancy, right? We're feeling that the reimbursement is less than what we really want to test for. Um, and so, you know, what this does is what the DMT has been doing is sort of refining down the number of genes to the minimum to the minimum to better fit within the reimbursement, you know, uh, pyramid there or um, triangle. Um, and then as additional testing modalities become cheaper and cheaper, that will also allow us to expand the, the gene me menus as well. Um, and so we did, we had faced a number of different challenges prior to the DMT, and we created solutions to all of those. And we were, we had a situation where too many or too few tests were being done before. We had inefficient workflow. We didn't have a comprehensive diagnosis. And we rectified all of those matters, and we hope that we are doing the right tests for the right patient at the right time. Um, this is part of a greater effort within Vanderbilt to look um, at how to make these multidisciplinary efforts to come together and give useful information to our clinician colleagues. Um, and so actually the first DMT was the coagulation DMT at Vanderbilt that uh, started in 2010. Um, the nice thing about coagulation is almost all of the testing occurs in a single coag lab, with the exception of factor V Leiden and prothrombin mutational testing, it's all in one lab. So that was the sort of the simplest model to begin with. Um, then we went to heme DMT where we're, uh, for heme path where we're drawing from multiple different labs within laboratory medicine. And then microbiology and, and blood bank were also brought on. Those are kind of DMT lights. You know, with coag and D, uh, heme path, it's like every single case g goes through this process. With microbiology and blood bank, it's only sort of sentinel cases that go through this process. Um, and then there's been a lot of talk about bringing this on to solid tumor oncology as well. This is much more logistically challenging because we're talking about surge path, lab medicine, oncology, radiology, and so that logistically is a much bigger problem. And the temporal issues are, are, are more of an issue there as well. Um, and so I just want to briefly um, go through some of the coagulation DMT analysis. This was a study done by uh, Dr. L Lawrence Van Horn where he looked at length, how the coagulation DMT was able to impact length of stay. Um, and so he compared pre and post implementation of the coag DMT. He did both parametric and non-parametric analyses um, for two different DRGs, one for pulmonary embolism and one for intracranial hemorrhage. And he looked at how this changed length of stay. Now this is mean length of stay, and this is median length of stay. And so that's, and one's parametric, one's non-parametric. And so that's why these numbers are a little bit different. But there was a, there was a trend towards decreasing length of stay by in implementing the DMT. And this is what the data actually looks like. Uh, along the x-axis are total charges for a patient hospital stay. Along the y-axis is the number of days, the length of stay. And the red dots are all before the COAG DMT. The green dots are all after the COAG DMT. And what you can see is that all of the outliers with the long length of stay and racking up the huge hospital bills, those are all occurring really pre-DMT. The, once the DMT went live, all of the, the green uh, dots are really clustered in the bottom left-hand corner. And the same thing is true for intracranial hemorrhage. 
And so what they were able to do is um, save about a quarter of a million dollars per year based on just on the COAG DMT. Um, and this was from two, sort of two factors contributing to this um, uh, savings. One is the shorter length of stay, and the other is the cost of unnecessary testing that's eliminated by test selection algorithms. Based on these numbers and extrapolating to the national scale, um, they came up with almost a, a billion dollar savings just for these two clusters nationally, which is a huge, huge amount. This is sort of, um, this is, the mathematics is, is down here, but really it's projected to be a, a potentially a billion dollars in savings. I'm going to skip over these last bits and just go to the take home messages, which is that um, most places have something along these lines already in place. We, this is not rocket science. We didn't invent something brilliant and new. We simply sort of rigorously put in place a system, bits and pieces of which everyone is doing all over the United States already. This is all familiar territory. Um, this can be done anywhere, okay? Um, I think everyone gets fixated and drools on all of our IT solutions, um, but the IT solutions are really just the icing on the cake, okay? Um, they, they do make things really pretty and really nice for us, but the fundamental part of it is just getting that buy-in from the clinicians and the pathologists together, deciding on those SOPs, um, making your testing decisions after you've looked at what's in the marrow, and then modifying those SOPs as needed um, based on your own internal evidence for your institution and turning it all into a comprehensive report at the end. And so this can be done anywhere. Um, so. Um, we were very fortunate to have a lot of support throughout the institution, and I think this can really only be done with a lot of institutional support. There's a certain amount that you can do just within pathology, but for a lot of our other stuff, especially with the IT, we really need to have full-on institutional support. Um, so Adam Siegmiller, Claudia Massa, and I were the three people who sat there and scribbled on napkins that bright, sunny spring morning. Um, Mary Zuter um, is, I think her title is Assistant Vice Chancellor of Integrated Diagnostics, and so she was really the one uh, in concert with our chair, Dr. Samuel Santoro, who basically got us all the institutional support that we needed to bring it up to a level where it got the institutional attention. Um, I took slides from Adam Siegmiller, who really took the bull by its horn and did a lot of the data analysis. We, we all contributed to the database, and then he's really been doing a lot of the data analysis. He's absolutely fabulous. Um, and Chuck Stratton and Pompey Young also contributed, and Mike Laposada contributed to some of the slides. Um, there are all of our hematology colleagues. This is just a short list of the people who contributed to the first SOPs. At this point, we've got everyone involved. Um, all of the administrative support um, has been phenomenal. And then finally, on the informatics side and bioinformatics side, but especially the informatics side, we've just had fabulous collaborators here who have really, as I mentioned, just really brought to life the things that we scribble on a, on a napkin. And I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.